Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to OGCI's Talking Transition podcast series. I'm Susan Kish, and I'm going to be your host for the next 30 minutes. This series looks at how the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, or OGCI, works. What does the energy transition really mean? What are the hard questions and the messy issues? And what are the challenges and opportunities that this transition may bring? We're going to frame this conversation around what, around why, around who, and most especially around how. We appreciate your time as listeners and going to work to keep the conversation short and clear. So let's start with the what. CCUS is one of OGCI's top priorities because it is an enabler for the energy transition in a whole lot of different ways. For each country, its value depends on the industrial makeup of that country, its access to things like technology and finance, its actual underlying geology, and the specific challenges that it faces from energy security to water supply. And therefore, OGCI started working a couple of years ago on a set of reports to explore the value of CCUS in specific countries in terms of its impact on GDP, jobs, competitiveness, energy security, and decarbonization. In 2018, our focus was on the UK and the Netherlands, where governments today are now pushing ahead with ambitious CCUS strategies and pretty far advanced CCUS hubs. Today, we're also working in China alongside a member, CNPC, and we recently published a summary of our work in Saudi Arabia alongside our member, Saudi Aramco, and that is our focus for today's conversation. Why? Well, Saudi Arabia is and will be a key participant in acting on the solutions to global climate change. It is the world's biggest oil producer. Its economy is dependent on oil exports. And at the same time, its domestic greenhouse gas emissions have grown as the country expands its industrial capacity. Traditionally, climate change has been viewed as a challenge to Saudi Arabia, but the government, through papers and research like this, is starting to see potential in this to modernize and diversify the economy. And recently announced a major green initiative. CCUS, along with Renewable Party, is at the heart of what they're proposing in terms of paradigm shift from a challenge to an opportunity. Who are we? Well, OGCI is composed of 12 companies from around the world. Together, these 12 account for almost 30% of the global oil and gas production. And at OGCI, they are working together towards achieving net zero emissions. Finally, who is our guest today? Well, Tijani Nyas this is the CCUS lead within the Technology, Strategy, and Planning Department in Saudi Aramco, where he's been since 2012. And Tijani led OGCI's work on identifying the value of CCUS for Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. So Tijani, good morning, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Hey, thank you, Susan. Very delighted to be here today. Excellent. So I'm going to start with the basics. So can you talk about the aim of the work and the report around CCUS in Saudi and what were the main findings that came out of that work? Uh, Susan, uh, as, you, as you know, uh, we have been talking about CCS as an important technology for achieving global uh, climate uh, objectives under the uh, Paris Agreement. The objective of the Saudi CCS white paper was to substantiate that importance by bringing the conversation much closer to Saudi uh, uh, policymakers for them to better understand what are the specific values CCS can unlock for uh, the Kingdom of, uh, of Saudi Arabia. So the white paper uh, clearly articulated those values in terms of uh, emissions management, uh, GDP growth, job creations, and economic diversification, which is really very central to the Kingdom Vision 2030. So can you talk about the impact, though, in terms of potential for storing or managing tons of CO2? Uh, when it comes to the uh, impact of CCS in Saudi Arabia, the potential is uh, quite significant and can help reduce, reuse, recycle and remove 100 million, ton, million tons of CO2 across key economic sectors 
including the uh, oil and gas industry, uh, power generation, water desal, and manufacturing industries such as steel, cement, and chemicals. So most of these industries are associated with uh, significant CO2 emissions, and CCS can play a significant role here in uh, uh, capturing and safely storing those emissions. The paper talks about two existing projects, one, I think, with SAPIC and one with Aramco. Can you talk about those which are in place and functioning today? Well, those two projects were launched back in 2015, uh, which was a key landmark in the climate uh, discussion. So the Saudi Aramco Othmania CCS uh, project is uh, captures around um, 800,000 uh, tons of CO2 per year from uh, a natural gas uh, uh, liquefaction uh, facility and then pipe it through 85 kilometer pipeline and then inject it in the Osmaria field, which is part of uh, uh, one of our largest uh, onshore fields. So uh, this project is actually one of the most sophisticated in the world because of the advanced monitoring and surveillance program that was implemented to monitor the CO2 plume and then and also the uh, the CO2 uh, breakthrough within the reservoir. And actually, it happened that, you know, the amount of CO2 that is being stored under this project is far beyond the industry uh, average because we store way more than uh, half of the CO2 that is being injected. So this is really a very great uh, success uh, when it comes to uh, 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 CO2 uh, uh, storage in, uh, in, in oil reservoirs. So the same year also, our sister company, Sabic, built uh, one of the world's largest uh, CO2 utilization project, capturing half a million tons of CO2 from uh, an Italian uh, glycol plant, and then using it to produce chemicals such as uh, methanol, urea, and also part of it is being utilized in the uh, food industry, uh, 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 in, the food, uh, food, food in, the, in the food and beverage uh, industry. Those are really two great uh, projects that are uh, in operation today in Saudi Arabia, capturing significant amount of CO2 and then making use of them. So they were launched in 2015. Any projects since that time? Well, since then, since then we have learned uh, a lot on the uh, CO2 capture and sequestration uh, and also on CO2 utilization. So, And also the kingdom has announced its uh, national framework on circular carbon economy, which has also CCS as one of the central pillar. So many studies are going on and the OGCI report that uh, was uh, released uh, recently uh, has a lot of elements you know, on how CCS can be scaled up in the kingdom and uh, activities and studies are going on to, uh, to materialize uh, uh, those, uh, those opportunities. I've always understood that Saudi Arabia saw climate change as really a threat to the underlying elements of its economy. Um, but based on our conversation and the and the possibilities that the paper raises, it I get the sense the view is changing. That there is a sense that there are opportunities that come from this energy transition for Saudi Arabia. Could you talk about that shift? Well, uh, thank you, Susan, for the question. So uh, indeed, you know, climate is uh, is a challenge for the entire world, and also uh, uh, more particularly for countries that has significant. Uh, endowment of uh, fossil fuel reserve in the form of oil and gas, and I would say even in the form of coal, because uh, those countries, they aim to valorize those uh, natural resources as part of their uh, uh, development agenda. So the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is very well known for uh, significant uh, oil and gas reserves, but also interestingly, uh, which uh, uh, not very well known uh, by uh, everyone is that the uh, renewable energy is extremely attractive here because of the uh, geographical geographical location of the of the kingdom. Actually, uh, solar and wind electricity generation in the kingdom is among the cheapest uh, location uh, globally. So at the same time, also we discuss the uh, potential uh, of CO2 uh, of CO2 storage in the kingdom. I think all combined in form of uh, potential for renewable energy, CO2 storage potential, low cost uh, oil and gas production, and also more importantly, 
low carbon footprint from our upstream uh, carbon uh, ups, ups, upstream production, which is among the lowest in the world. All these combined give you really all the ingredients to play a clear leadership role in the energy transition and then kind of transform what was perceived as being a challenge as a real opportunity for the kingdom going forward. So you mentioned low carbon products in the paper and when we talked earlier. Um, and you also mentioned this interesting project with Japan on ammonia. Can you talk about that and explain how that worked? Well, I will start with the low carbon product, which was uh, really one of the uh, key takeaways or findings from the uh, Saudi CCS white paper. Actually, CCS can, can help decarbonize uh, uh, many industries, including manufacturing, cement, steel, chemicals, etc., and oil and gas, in addition to, uh, to the power and uh, desalination uh, uh, sectors. So all these projects, you know, when decarbonized through uh, CCS, become low carbon product that can be exported to other countries. And uh, to demonstrate one of the key uh, low carbon products, so recently Saudi Aramco, in collaboration with SABIC and uh, Japan, we demonstrated the uh, blue ammonia, ammonia supply chain. And the project started by capturing, by producing hydrogen uh, from uh, natural gas, and then we capture the uh, CO2 from the uh, hydrogen production step. That CO2 was uh, uh, transported and uh, stored in the uh, Osmania CO2 uh, UR project that I mentioned earlier. And then the CO2 free hydrogen is utilized to produce ammonia. And that ammonia is being shipped to Japan uh, to be used for power, power generation. It's one of the uh, uh, many examples that uh, really demonstrate you know, how we can combine uh, CCS with uh, uh, hydrocarbon resources to produce uh, zero uh, CO2 emissions products such as hydrogen or ammonia. The paper talked about steel, low carbon steel and low carbon cement. Do you ever see a time when Saudi Arabia would be a, a, an exporter of those kinds of products? Well, I hope this will come uh, anytime soon. Uh, there is no project that captures CO2 from steel in Saudi Arabia as we speak now. But uh, in the United Arab Emirates, which is uh, uh, our neighbor country, there is one of the largest, uh, actually the largest uh, CO2 capture from a steel plant, which is producing, I would say, green steel also, where at the scale of, uh, of Othmania, around 0.8 million tons of CO2 have been captured from, uh, from that steel plant and then uh, used for enhanced oil recovery. So those type of uh, business models or uh, technologies will definitely uh, come on stream in the future globally and also in Saudi Arabia, I hope. So net-net, you're saying that there are sectors that are sort of, you can see potential in the shorter term, like ammonia and chemicals. And then there are some sectors in the longer term, like cement and refinery and steel. Is Did I get that right? Well, not necessarily. The uh, When it's come to carbon capture, you know, the cost is very important. Uh, but the complexity of the technology uh, is also important. Capturing CO2 from natural gas plant, from ammonia plant, from, from hydrogen plant uh, uh, is, 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 is cost effective and also very simple compared to capturing CO2 from refineries where you have multiple sources of CO2 being emitted or from uh, a cement plant. So, uh, uh, but we will need all these technologies to, to decarbonize through, uh, through CCS and cost will definitely go down as we build, as we build more and more plants. Tijani, I'd like to ask you a question that I continually think about around CCS, which is that the technology isn't new, right? There've been enhanced oral recovery for decades and, and there's been storage of carbon in the North Sea for decades. So what has held back this technology from the scale and impact that it has the potential? Everybody says CCS is going to be incredibly important in terms of addressing climate change and the climate crisis, but it just hasn't scaled. So what's holding it back? Uh, you are absolutely right, Susan. CCS has been around for a decade, and actually the oil and gas uh, industry has been injecting CO2 since the 60s. Uh, what is different now is the global momentum we are witnessing for scaling up CCS. 
this is mainly because there is no there is a growing recognition by uh, many countries that net zero emissions is almost impossible without CCS. Also, some leading policies like the 45Q in the US uh, have demonstrated to be effective when it comes to scaling up CCS. So the oil and gas industry also through the OGCI is taking concrete actions uh, through the uh, OGCI uh, CCS Kickstarter initiative to accelerate large scale deployment by providing expertise and financial support to project developers. So this is uh, really exciting in my view, but uh, the challenge remains uh, quite huge, requiring all stakeholders to work together. So the CCS industry, we will have to build, will have to be, to achieve the objective of the Paris Agreement, will have to be at the scale of today's oil and gas industry. So it's going to be massive. But uh, the good news is that again, you know, Many governments are uh, supporting the scale up of CO2, and I hope this will be materialized uh, in the next decade. Let me just make sure I got heard this right. The CCUS industry is going to be have to be at the scale of the global oil and gas industry to have the kind of impact it needs? If you look at the uh, objective of the Paris Agreement, let's say if we have to capture and store uh, around one gigaton of CO2 by 2030, so that in terms of volume of uh, down CO2 will be at the scale of today's oil and gas industry. So that's going to be really uh, massive. And those are the ambitions that we need to be on track for the Paris objective. Got it. All right. That's a lot. So let's focus in on that a little bit. Do you think, uh, how much potential is there for technology and the costs of these projects to reduce? Is this going to be like solar and wind where you've seen costs drop by 80, 90% over a 10 or 20 year period? Will we, do you foresee something like that? Well, uh, that's an excellent question because uh, climate is also, it's not only about ambition, it's about also urgency. So we have to do many different things in the next decade to be on track for delivering on the Paris Agreement. So uh, uh, CCS costs will have to reduce or to decline very rapidly and significantly. The good news is that the technology is mature, is proven. As we speak now, there are more than 20 uh, large-scale CCS facilities in operation uh, globally. And uh, new concepts are emerging, such as CCS hubs, where the uh, CO2 transport and uh, storage infrastructure is uh, shared between different emitters, bring, bringing uh, down significantly the cost through economies of scale. But definitely, we need to be on the similar curve of what has happened in the uh, solar and wind energy if we have to uh, uh, achieve the objective of uh, of the of the uh, of, of the Paris Agreement. So, two other related questions: What are the barriers or obstacles or potential in policy support? Uh, it does seem like the role of governments in accelerating this is important. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, we need more government to recognize CCS as part of their climate strategies. We need government also to put the right policies in place with the long-term visibility on the CO2 uh, uh, stored uh, uh, through uh, those technologies because uh, storing CO2, if you store CO2, is going to last for uh, many, many decades or maybe hundreds of years underground. So project developers need to have longer-term visibility. Government need also to work with the private sector to bring in finance not only the multilateral development banks, but also even the private banks, they all have a role to play. It's going to be uh, 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 something that would uh, mobilize the resources across uh, multiple stakeholders to get this done. And what about business models? You know, there is a, a, there's currently a gap between the cost of doing all this until the prices drop uh, and the revenues, income, offsets that come in on the other side. What are the business models you're seeing that you think might apply in Saudi to address those? Which business models make you excited? Well, things, things are being discussed, but I like very much the uh, business model around uh, CCS hubs, 
where we have a very clear, uh, 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 very clear stakeholder engagement. So there will be some emitters. There will be uh, companies also specialized on uh, transporting and storing uh, CO2. But again, government will have to put uh, uh, in place the uh, right policies and then the right framework for all these stakeholders to play uh, their role. I read recently that in this large green initiative that Saudi announced, they talked about planting 10 billion trees sure. uh, to absorb carbon dioxide. And I think there's also exploration around some of the emerging negative emissions technologies like direct air capture. How do those connect with CCUS in Saudi and the region? Well, they are all the key ingredient of the circular carbon economy. The 10, million, uh, 10 billion trees to be planted in Saudi Arabia is going to be one of the uh, major uh, afforestation projects globally. And this will be contributing non, not only to capturing or removing CO2 emissions from Saudi Arabia, but also uh, globally. At the same time, direct air carbon capture is absolutely a necessity for achieving carbon balance in the in the future. But the cost of direct carbon of direct air carbon capture will somehow uh, have to go down uh, significantly because today the cost is around uh, a couple of hundred of dollar per ton, and we wish this cost to be around uh, less than hundred dollar per ton to 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 be rapidly uh, scaled up. So they all contribute to uh, uh, to uh, removing uh, emissions from the atmosphere, and they have an absolutely critical role on achieving net zero. So Tijani, you have many projects, I'm sure, that you're looking at. Why are you so interested in CCUS? And what personally makes you committed to this technology? Oh, this is a very exciting question. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I started my, uh, my career as a young scientist working on uh, CO2 capture technologies uh, some 20 years uh, ago in, uh, in France. So since then, I have been seeing the progress, uh, 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 the technology progressing toward being more effective, more efficient, and then costs going, uh, go going down. So, uh, and also uh, some large scale projects are being built you know, in Europe, in uh, North America, and we have some also in Saudi Arabia. But I believe this is just the, the beginning because, as we said, we need to build something at the scale of the oil and gas industry. And I'm very excited that, you know, I will witness maybe some of these large scale projects uh, 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 getting uh, get into the market. Very cool. Tijani, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate having you join us today. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, listeners, for joining us today as we looked at some of the core questions and the challenges and the opportunities on delivering on the potential of CCUS carbon capture use and storage within the national strategy of Saudi Arabia and actually across the Gulf. I'd like to invite all of our listeners to visit our website, OGCI.com, and read this white paper on CCUS in Saudi Arabia. And please join our next podcast where we're going to be talking to Morgan Bazilian of the Payne Institute to discuss a project we're doing with the World Bank, Payne Institute, and OGCI to improve our monitoring of global methane flaring using satellite data. And please follow us, OGCI and OGCI Climate Investments, which is our billion plus fund that invests in technologies and projects that are focused on impact and accelerating decarbonization. Follow us on LinkedIn and on Twitter at OGCI News. And finally, thank you to our production team here at OGCI, to our editor, Delia Meth Cohen, and our producer, Jason De La Cruz. Stay safe, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. <laughs>